Welcome back to our intermediate financial accounting class. In our last few segments, we've been talking about equity and it's been a really fun discussion, hasn't it? Nice, basic journal entries with basic equations to keep it easy for our owners to see exactly what's going on with their investment. Now that we've wrapped up our discussion of equity, we've talked about all of the pieces of this liabilities and equity model that we're talking about as part of our overall discussion of financial accounting. So at this point, we've wrapped up two major sections, our discussion of the accounting cycle and our discussion of the balance sheet. And we now get to turn our attention to the income statement, talking about some of the more detailed pieces that make up our calculations of that really important statement. We're going to break this part, income from operations, down into three pieces. We'll talk about revenues, then we'll talk about pensions, and finally, we'll talk about leases. And I have to say, all three of these are really hot topics right now because FASB has been messing around or changing the rules on all of them. Some of the changes are really minor, but all of them have been hit. And this first one that we need to talk about, revenue recognition, is the most important of all because it has changed accounting for everybody in the profession. And it's been a huge fight in the news dealing with uh, the changes in the way that computer systems work, the way that we record our revenue, the way that we defend the revenue that we recognize, the footnotes we have to disclose. There is tons and tons and tons involved in the change. And we're going to talk about the new rules so that by the time you get out of school and are ready to go, you're already comfortable with this new method that FASB's had us move into. As we get started in this, I just have to, to tell you about a story that I heard from a, let's see, wasn't a CFO, he was a controller of a mid-size corporation. He came and talked to my classes about the changes that FASB was proposing. And he said that his company spent about half a million dollars figuring out revenue recognition for their company. And that was in training costs and time spent and getting auditors and special consultants in, rewriting the computer programs, etc. And he said, after all of that money and all of that time and all of that stress, the overall effect on the financial statements was immaterial. So his comment was, never have so many done so much to accomplish so little which means that this has become a really sore spot for a lot of accountants. The good news for us is, once you get used to this new method, it actually makes a lot of sense, gives companies some flexibility, and will make you look really good to your employers because you're already comfortable with the new method. We're gonna break our discussion of revenues down into two pieces. We'll talk about FASB's preference, recording revenue after it's earned, and then we'll talk about the few times when FASB allows companies to recognize revenue early. Let's start our discussion by talking about why we even care about revenue recognition. Well, you need to understand that revenue recognition is the biggest challenge that we have with companies. It's difficult for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is because if companies have a chance to manipulate their financial statements, the easiest way to make themselves look better is to bump up their revenues. So we get a lot of companies that are trying to improve their revenue by playing around with their numbers. So that makes it really important for us as internal accountants, as internal auditors, and as traditional auditors, that we understand and know what the rules should be so that we can avoid mistakes or purposeful uh, misrepresentations of revenue. In addition, the standard for revenue recognition has been really, really complex. You see, if we were to print all of GAAP, it would stand, oh, pretty close to five feet tall. At least it would have about a year ago. What's happened in this last year or two years is that FASB has embarked on what we call or they call the simplification process. The simplification process is designed to weed out some of the most challenging parts of GAAP so that it's easier for companies to implement. And one of the biggest areas that they hit was revenue recognition. Why? Well, because of that five feet of paper, no one topic had more pages devoted to it than revenue recognition. There were specific rules, general rules, industry exceptions, examples of all the rules. It was a lot to wade through and sort through in order to determine the appropriate way of recording revenue. So right now, revenue is a hot topic as we move away from those very detailed rules to a series of five principles that FASB has now put together 
along with IASB, to be the way that we're going to recognize revenue. So on the one hand, this has made revenue recognition much easier because it gets us away from all the detailed rules. On the other hand, it's made it more complex because all of us are transitioning to this new style and this new method. So that makes revenue recognition a really hot topic at the moment. If you understand then what the rules were and what the rules are or what they're evolving to, then you'll be in a better position moving forward both to get it right and to make sure those around you are doing it correctly. So let's take a second and look at the current rules or the old rules depending on when you're seeing this video. Now if you remember from our discussion way back in Intermediate Part 1, we said that revenue recognition under the current or old standard had three different parts or elements. In order to recognize revenue, the first thing you had to do was ensure that it was realized or realizable. Realize means that the goods or services have been exchanged for cash or some other claim to cash or other assets. Realizable meaning that we're pretty sure we're going to get paid. So that was the first piece of being able to recognize revenue under the current or old rules. The next major element was that we had to have earned the revenue. So the goods are produced or they are almost produced, ready to be picked up, or we've performed the service that we promised we would provide in exchange for whatever consideration, stock or cash or other assets that they could give to us. So we had to have a guarantee of some kind that we would get paid. We had to have done the work, and the last one is we had to have a contract of some kind, a purchase order, an implicit contract, like when you go to Walmart and you buy something there, they give you a receipt, that's the evidence of a contract. So it didn't have to be anything big and complex, it just had to be a little thing. And those were our rules for a long time. The problem with this setup was it was really difficult to understand what exactly does it mean to be realized and how do we tell for sure that it is earned. And again, this generated pages and pages and pages of gap to try to address these issues. So FASB decided that they were going to switch things up. They did this in 2014. It was really a surprise to most of us because we were watching the accounting standards codification, that's the database of GAAP, looking for FASB to replace the 605s. Those were the revenue recognition rules. And normally when FASB passes a new rule, they replace the old rule with the new rule. So we were all watching 605 to see if it would change. And it didn't, and it didn't, and it didn't, and it didn't. I've been asked to do a presentation to the Oregon Society of CPAs about the upcoming standards. And I was watching really carefully but nothing happened. So I thought, okay, I'll just use the proposed standards. That'll be fine. That's what I'll talk to them about. And about a week before I left, I happened to be on a website talking about GAP, and it mentioned the new revenue recognition rules. And that caught me by surprise, because there weren't any new rules. I'd been watching, and the 605s hadn't changed. Went back in and took another look, because I was freaking out a week before I was making a presentation to a bunch of CFOs and controllers. And sure enough, FASB had passed the revenue recognition standard, and made it 606. So instead of replacing the old rule like they normally do, they made a whole new set of rules. And it caught a lot of us by surprise uh, that they passed this rule so quickly. Now in the time since then, they've made a bunch of changes and updates and moved the time when it would become effective and all sorts of things to, to make it a little easier for professionals to implement this new set of standards. But this was a really big deal when they passed it and has continued to be a big deal as we've tried to update computer systems and methods and auditing styles to make sure that we can capture the new rule. Now the new rule really comes down to these five principles. Number one, you have to identify a contract. Number two, you have to identify your performance obligations. Number three, we determine the transaction price or what we're going to get paid. Number four, we allocate the price to the different obligations. That's the obligations that we identified up in step two. And then step five, when we complete an obligation, then we recognize the revenue allocated to that obligation in step four. So the step five is the best part. That's the journal entries. We're going to talk again about all of these individually, but just make sure that you're comfortable with these five. I would say this is our most important key concept for our revenue recognition discussion is the list of these five principles. You have to know these five and what they mean, both for the exam and for what you'll be doing as you leave school and get into the business world. 
So let's talk first about identifying a contract. And there's a lot of details here, but I've tried to summarize the most important parts of deciding, is there a real contract? Now, a caveat here. There is a difference between what you've learned in business law as a contract and what FASB considers a contract. So please note that I'm not talking about a generic contract like you'd see in a business law or from a law firm. We're talking about what FASB recognizes. And the definitions are a little bit different. So just be aware that it's not going to match up exactly. This is FASB's definition of a revenue contract. So here's what they need. First, the terms have to have been approved of and committed to by both parties. So the vendor and the purchaser, or the buyer, have both agreed to what's going on, usually by some kind of a signature or again by implication. If you take stuff up to the checkout counter at Walmart and pay them the money, we assume that contract exists implicitly, even though there's not a piece of paper there. Second, the rights of both parties are identified. Again, for a really simple example, we'll just stick with Walmart. They know they get the money. I know I get my stuff. Th those are the rights that we have. I also know that they have a return policy. I can bring stuff back. I know that I can buy stuff online and have it delivered to the store and held until I get there, etc. So those are the rights of the contract. Next, the payment terms are identified. When are we going to get paid? How are we going to get paid? Is there interest if we pay late, etc.? Fourth, the contract has to have commercial substance. Now, we talked about commercial substance mostly with the exchange of property plant equipment. But just as a refresher, commercial substance means that there is a substantial impact on the business. So in this case, we're not talking about large changes. For example, Walmart selling me a t-shirt or a pair of shoes would not be a big deal for them. But it has commercial substance in the effect that they have done what they do as a company. And it has an impact because it generates a rapport with me that might bring me back. So it's a little bit different than the big idea of commercial substance that we were talking about before when we talked about it with PP&E, but the same basic idea applies. Next, we have to be sure or relatively sure that we're going to get paid. Now, again, if we're talking about Walmart, they don't give me my stuff till I give them the money. They're really sure they're going to get paid. They've got my money. But do they? I can return these items. So Walmart, in deciding whether or not they can recognize revenue, has to factor in the probability that I might bring that stuff back. And so they recognize a little less revenue in order to recognize the fact that returns will be forthcoming. And this becomes a much bigger deal when you're selling on credit or if you've got a new client, you're not sure how exactly they're going to pay or when they're going to pay. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to go ahead and stop right there. When we come back in our next segment, we will be talking about the other four parts of recognizing revenue. And we're going to throw in some examples so that we can actually see how this works as we go through the process. So more fun stuff to come. I'll see you then. Thanks.